Hi everyone, welcome back to another video, and today I'm actually doing a response video to a caller that called into Skeptic Generation this morning. I could not watch the live show today because I was actually at the hospital doing my internal medicine rotation, uh, but when I got home and I watched the replay, it was... Uh, it was a lot. I was kind of seething with rage, and I know a lot of people in the comments were too. Um, luckily, this person did not persuade the people in, in the live chat, which is good. Uh, but I'm worried that the things that this person said are going to have negative consequences with how people view COVID, and they're going to use this to justify uh, being hesitant about the vaccine and justify not listening to the experts. And basically, this call was a doctor in the UK, a general practitioner, and I'm not going to make any claims that this person um, was lying about their expertise and their field of study. Um, that's not my place. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and just and assume that they are telling the truth about that. Um, because just because you're a doctor doesn't mean that you're up to date on all the information. It doesn't mean your data is true, and it does not mean that you don't have bias. Everybody has bias. And the thing that was worrying, though, was when somebody is so passionate about their bias that they call into a show and platform said bias um, without being able to demonstrate it and without having um, good arguments to support it. And I'm not going to debate her on uh, the statistics, like the actual statistics and numbers themselves. I'm going to address the rhetoric behind what she said, talk about what she claims, and then what arguments she tries to use to back it up, and hopefully um, make this seem less convincing for you. Um, so her claim, starting off, is that children under 16 should not receive the COVID vaccine. Okay, so... Um, First of all, we are not arguing for the safety of the vaccine uh, for use in children 12 and under, uh, or just under 12. I think 12 exactly is approved. Um, but we're not making that argument. So it's kind of a moot point to say that uh, we are going to give this vaccine to people under 12. It has not been demonstrated to be effective or safe in children under 12. So that is an irrelevant point. We're not going to address that. Um, it is shown that uh, people 12 to 15, um, it is safe to give it to them. And so we do include those. And then we also include up through adulthood. It has shown been shown to be safe. Um, so that point there, under 12, not really a good argument because we, we don't use the vaccine in that case yet. Once as it has been demonstrated to be safe in that population, the age will be extended and then we will make that argument. Um, so how does she make, uh, how does she try to justify these claims? So she starts off with an appeal to authority fallacy. Uh, she basically comes in and says, I'm a doctor, trust me. And uh, of course she doesn't use those words exactly, but it's, there's this assumption that because she is a doctor and because she has experience, that she is an expert on the subject matter and that she has the correct information. And while doctors are more likely to be educated on the subject and more likely to have truthful information, there is bias. Doctors are human and humans are really good at injecting bias into pretty much everything. And it's probably not intentional that she has these biases. She might not even know that she has these biases, but this is why we have peer review and why we have studies that try to control for this bias um, because we know that we're going to insert it. So we just need to do a better job at being aware of our bias and how we're using our bias and just say, hey, maybe maybe I'm putting some bias into this. Maybe I can't make this claim and maybe I don't have the ability to back this up. Can we do a study on it? Um, for example, Dr. Oz. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Dr. Oz. He is a doctor and he spouts quackery very openly. Um, so just being a doctor does not mean that you're correct. And this is fallacious reasoning. Um, so studies that we do correct for this bias, and this is why we use a lot of math, and this is why we, we study biostatistics. And I'm going to do a whole section later about how we do this, how we correct for bias, and how we look for a study that um, does demonstrate causality. And I'm going to use my whiteboard for that, and that is why I'm not going to do that right now, because I really want to draw all this out for you and why um, this argument is a problem. Um, but the next thing that she does is she uses a black swan fallacy. Um, so basically, she says, uh, I don't see the long-term effects of, of the 
of COVID in my clinic. With regard to children uh, under 16, I believe she's specifically referring to, she says um, that when kids come into her clinic, she does not see children with COVID having long-term complications. And this is an example of the black swan fallacy because she is essentially saying, I didn't see it. I've never seen a black swan. Therefore, it doesn't exist. I haven't seen a child with COVID complications. Therefore, it doesn't exist. This is a way that people can sneak in some bias because populations exist outside of your own medical practice and your own experience. Her practice has a limited sample size. So there are only so many people that come through that clinic, and a lot of them are, are going to be repeats. Um, and it's not representative of the general population, whereas you take a study that has um, hundreds of of people, like the minimum, thousands of people uh, more likely, and, and you can compare multiple uh, groups of people across a broader population, and you're less likely to get bias. Uh, for example, um, having a study limited to middle-aged people in the United Kingdom uh, does not correct for a lot of bias. Maybe you'd see different results in uh, somebody in America, you see different things in, in somebody in Australia. And that's a lot that you can't really control for. Um, so she might not be wrong. Uh, she m might not see these complications of COVID, but you can't rely on a small sample size and say that that's adequate data to make these claims. Um, also, something that she does is she has some sneaky wording in how she said, no healthy child dies of COVID. And she is right because of this word healthy. And I saw a lot of people in the comments addressing this as well, because once you contract COVID and are symptomatic, you are no longer part of the healthy population. You have now entered into a disease state. You are no longer healthy. So yeah, people who are healthy do not die of COVID because if you are healthy, you are not part of the symptomatic group. And, and therefore you would not die of COVID. Uh, however, healthy children um, who may be asymptomatic carriers have been demonstrated by research to be a vector of disease and a Petri dish for mutation. So the reason why we care about the healthy children um, getting vaccinated is because they can carry COVID and they can um, they are a petri dish for mutation. We are seeing this in the unvaccinated populations um, where they are carrying this virus and they can't get rid of it super well. Uh, so it mutates in their body, but they don't know they have it because they're asymptomatic. So they go out into public and spread it to people. We are finding out that children can be asymptomatic carriers as well. And so this is why we need to vaccinate them because um, sure, not every child is immunocompromised or has chronic illness, um, but the ones who are healthy may not know that they have COVID, they might spread it to somebody who is immunocompromised who may not be able to get a vaccine. And this is why this is important. But she does use that wording and it's very sneaky. So not a reason to believe her on that point. And then something else I want to address is she talks a lot about cost benefit analysis, which is very interesting because we actually do weigh this a lot in medical practice. Um, but sometimes we do take a risk for the greater good. Uh, and this is true even regarding side effects of a medication. For example, um, if somebody comes into the hospital and they're admitted for sepsis, sepsis is very dangerous. It's a bacterial infection, um, or I guess you can have fungal sepsis, other types of sepsis. Uh, it's an infection in your blood that goes to your whole body. It can be very dangerous and you can die very quickly. You go into shock. Um, and we do something called empirical treatment. And this is something that uh, it's not necessarily like, when, when you have an infection, we, we don't have uh, a short enough time to, uh, when you're getting these labs. You have to grow the culture. You have to find out what the, what the organism is that's infecting you. And it takes a long time to get those results back. So we don't have the time to sit back, confirm a diagnosis, and then give you the treatment to avoid side effects. Uh, what we do is we give you empirical treatment with vancomycin, zosin, uh, which is piperacillin, uh, tazobactam, and clindamycin. And these all cover for different things. So vanco is given for staph, so that's covering for MRSA. You give zosin to cover for gram negatives and pseudomonas. And you give clindamycin to cover uh, anaerobes. And the reason is because 
once it's a lot easier to start all of these medications and then you can remove ones that you don't need once you find out that they're not necessary. Um, but it's a lot harder to give uh, medications in smaller amounts, give only one at a time, find out it doesn't, doesn't work, and then uh, essentially cause mutations to happen uh, and cause drug resistance in the bacterial population, making it a lot harder to eradicate the infection. Um, and when I'm talking about these drugs, vancomycin and zosin uh, and clindamycin all have very nasty side effects. Uh, it, they're not fun drugs to have. Uh, a lot of you may know vancomycin is associated with C. diff. Uh, the most common cause of C. diff is after you undergo a treatment of vancomycin. It's very aggressive. Um, but the side effects are minimal compared to the damage done by sepsis. And so we would rather risk these side effects and give you three very potent antibiotics and then remove them one at a time once we realize what the infection is, uh, taper it down um, to get the right amount so that we, uh, we would rather risk you have side effects and not die of sepsis than be like, uh... Well, the side effects are bad, so I might as well die of sepsis. No, we don't do that. Cost-benefit analysis is actually in favor of starting treatment in this case, and this is also the same case with COVID. You have um, some potential. We don't even know if they are side effects associated with COVID, the COVID vaccine, and I will go into that later about uh, correlation and causation. But anyway, you have potential side effects of the COVID vaccine, uh, but then you have known side effects of COVID infection and of um, of shock associated with COVID, of with hospitalization associated with COVID. We know that you have risk of getting a pulmonary embolism from having COVID. COVID makes you hypercoagulable, and uh, this is a known risk. So what we're doing here, this is cost-benefit analysis. We would rather take the risk with some side effects because these can often be treated. Um, you can treat allergic reactions. You can... Um, do a lot of things about that, uh, and you cannot really go back and undo a COVID infection. So that that's something there. We do take these cost-benefit uh, risks a lot, and uh, so this argument is invalid. Um, next is natural immunity is equal to the immunity given from the vaccine. So she kind of makes this claim that if you get COVID, you're going to have antibodies necessary to give you prolonged immunity in a similar way that the vaccine would. And this is also very risky and goes against the cost-benefit analysis that she was saying previously, um, because in order to get the natural immunity, you have to get the infection. And that includes the risk of complications of said infection. Are you going to say the same thing about measles? Uh, especially as a doctor, are you going to say that you'd rather somebody become naturally immune to measles uh, then get a measles vaccine. No, you wouldn't because you know that um, even though it doesn't happen to everybody with measles, you know that a good percentage of them um, get encephalitis. And this is brain swelling. Uh, it's very problematic. You can die. And we've decided that this is not, it's not worth it to risk getting encephalitis to get natural immunity from measles. We decided that we needed a vaccine for measles. So we vaccinate for measles. We vaccinate pretty much everybody for measles. So it's the same thing. Like I said with, with COVID, it's known to cause hypercoagulability, uh, increase the risk of pulmonary embolism. Um, we are willing to risk side effects from a vaccine uh, to avoid known risks of getting COVID. Um, so this natural immunity argument is also kind of pointless and does not, does not achieve the goal that I think she wishes it did. And then finally, we are going to talk about VARES and correlation versus causation. And I'm going to pull up my whiteboard and we're going to talk about this in a second. But um, first of all, I want to address VARES and um, VARES is known to be unregulated and unreliable. Anybody can put uh, can report side effects of anything. And this is bias. This is absolutely inserting bias where it does not belong. Um, because you need to demonstrate that there is a causal relationship between the intervention and the side effect. And I'm going to do a little bit of an example here. Um, let's say uh, we give you a, a drug A, 
Uh, and this is being tested to see if it causes lung cancer. So drug A is given to 10 people. Eight of these 10 people who took the drug developed lung cancer. Okay, so you have it. If, if you just did the math like she did, you have an 80% chance of getting lung cancer, according to this population. Or do you? We don't, we don't know. Because I didn't tell the whole story, right? So I told you that 8 out of 10 people develop lung cancer after receiving this drug. What if I told you that 3 of these people who developed lung cancer after taking this drug have a family history of lung cancer and are prone to develop it anyway? Who's to say that these 3 people would not have, would not have developed lung cancer coincidentally? Um, because of their family history, they are already at high risk. Did the, did the drug cause the lung cancer or were they going to develop it anyway and they just happen to have the drug in between? And then what if I also told you that the other five people that got lung cancer after receiving this drug are heavy smokers and are at also at high risk for getting lung cancer? So you see these eight people, sure, it's an 80% out of the 10 that we sampled, but they all had reasons that it could be coincidental that they had this effect. So how do we correct for this bias? And the first way that we do this is with increasing our sample size. So with 10 people, what's the likelihood that these 10 people are going to be accurate representations of the general public? Probably not, especially if I'm in one location, I'm just at my doctor's office and I'm recruiting people and just say, hey, do you wanna be part of the study? And I don't do any kind of screening to see um, what their history is, what uh, kind of variables we're looking out for. We don't control for anything. And it turns out we can <laughs> show a correlation. That's not going to work well. The more people we add to a study, so if I say, like, so we, if we have these 8 out of 10 people, but now we have 8 people who developed lung cancer in a population of 100 people. That's a much lower percentage now because we've increased our population size. What if I had 1,000 people and we only had 8 people who developed lung cancer? So you see how the, you can manipulate the numbers in a lot of ways to kind of demonstrate whatever point you want. And so we need to correct it. We need to use stats to actually demonstrate this relationship and if there is significance there. And something that she uh, says in her phone call is that we don't know what the future consequences are. And this is not a cause to reject the null hypothesis. So if uh, we're talking to a lot of the atheist community here, and there's a phrase that we use a lot with um, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, right? Um, so what we're doing here is essentially the same thing. Um, we have something called the null hypothesis, and we need to demonstrate if we are going to reject the null hypothesis. And I'm going to pull up my whiteboard here, and I'm going to explain exactly what this means. All right, so I've pulled up my little whiteboard here, and we have something called the null hypothesis. And this is kind of our baseline assumption. So the baseline assumption of pretty much any intervention is that there is no relationship between X and Y, so X being the intervention and Y being the results. Um, the null hypothesis is just saying that we assume that there is no relationship, or at least no significant relationship between X and Y, their relationship is coincidental. So when we do a study, the goal um, is to either affirm the null hypothesis, so demonstrate that this relationship is coincidental, or the alternative is to reject the null hypothesis. And this is what I mean when I say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Um, because here's the null, here's our assumption that there's no relationship. Rejecting the null is an extraordinary claim. This is something outside of the ordinary. This is outside of what we can see with reality so far. Um, so in order to reject the null, you need to demonstrate that you can reject the null. And what this means, when you reject the null, you say that there is a significant relationship between X and Y and is not likely to be coincidental. So you have to prove that this is not a coincidence, uh, that there is something else within this relationship that is different than if it was a coincidence. So uh, specifically in this case, um, rejecting the null would be to say that there is a causal relationship between the COVID-19 vaccine 
and the side effects that people are reporting. And the null hypothesis would be to say that it's purely coincidental that there are these effects um, after the COVID vaccine and there is no significant relationship. So exactly how do we do this? There's a lot of math that goes into it. I'm not going to calculate this out, uh, but depending on how you do your statistics, you might do a T, like a T score, you might do a Z score. But at the end of the day, your goal is to kind of make this graph. Uh, so this is just a uh, normal distribution. So you can see our bell curve. The center is the mean and um, the outside, this is 95th percentile. And I have down there, we're not going to focus too much on the other tail. Um, but the higher on this graph you are is the frequency of an event happening. Um, so the mean is the average. This is the average situation. And what we're trying to do, uh, we're going to do some math and we're going to generate a number called the p-value. And oftentimes, uh, this p-value can be any different um, number, but typically if we're going for statistical significance, uh, we want it to be less than 0 0.05. And what this means, uh, so your p-value is representative of the probability that your result is not a coincidence. So like, what is the chance uh, that this is not coincidental? Um, and how we get this is uh, your p-value less than 0 0.05 puts you somewhere in this small area of our graph. And this means there is a 95% chance that getting a result in this part of the graph is not a coincidence. So that would mean the remaining 95%. So if I were to put a value somewhere over here, that would likely be a coincidence. But if I put a value over here and it's outside of the norm for 95% of the population of the study, it's probably not a coincidence. You can probably safely say that there is a relationship. And this is kind of how you demonstrate causality, how you prove significance. And so when you when you have a value that is less than 0 0.05, you can say this is statistically significant. There is something here that we need to look into. Um, so without having this, um, if you do not have these numbers, you don't have a, a study that can reject the null, you need to accept the null until it can be proven otherwise. So this is how we get that. Um, I hope this video made sense. This call was really frustrating. And I, I did want to be nicer about this because I don't think that she's intentionally misleading people. I think she has good intentions. They are just biased. And I don't know if she's aware of her bias, but we need to correct our bias and it's good to be called out on our bias. Um, because I know I don't want to mislead people. I'm sure most people don't want to mislead people. And we want to make sure that correct information is getting out there, especially with regard to you making your own healthcare decisions for yourself and listening to your doctor and the experts that are, are saying otherwise. Um, of course, there are people that should not be getting the vaccine. Uh, you need to talk to your doctor. You should not be listening to people on YouTube telling you that you should not get a vaccine. Talk to your doctor about your specific situation, but most people are appropriate for a vaccine. And with that, I'm going to sign off. So please like, comment, and subscribe. Leave your debates in the comments below, and I will see you all in the next one.